Welcome to The Near Memo, a weekly conversation about search, social, and commerce. What happened, why it matters, and the implications for local. Work. What, what's interesting, is sort of to, to move into my segment on the Moz uh, Local Reviews Survey, what's interesting is that the number one, and this is pretty consistent with other surveys, the number one reason in the Moz survey that people write critical or negative reviews is because they get bad service. Right. I mean, this is a this is a, a consistent problem, um, which is which is amazing to me because it's relatively easy to deliver good service. You may not always be able to deliver the right outcome or the outcome that people expect, but you can you can treat people with respect. You can respond to them in a timely way. You can explain situations. You can offer them some sort of compensation or whatever it is. And yet again and again and again and again, these these corporations fail that test despite paying lip lip service to it. But just to kind of quickly uh, summarize the Moz survey, you know, there have been a ton of these surveys, consumer surveys, I've done them, Bright Local does them every year. Um, A lot of companies have done them, you know, sort of cataloging review motivations, behavior, and so on and so forth. And um, Miriam Ellis wrote up the the findings. I'm gonna write a piece on Near Media about it and what I think is interesting about it. But basically it confirms it's a thousand US adults or approximately a thousand, maybe a little over that. It confirms um, what we already know. You know, people people write reviews to share their experiences. They write reviews when they have a bad service experience. Um, Most people read reviews. Uh, So there's a lot of stuff that there that you would expect and that isn't a surprise. Um, One of the things about writing when you have bad experience, it is often motivated as much by their desire to educate other consumers as it is absolutely. to punish the business. Right. Share their experience. Came out in this server, right? Yeah. To share the experience, right? Right. Negative it's or not positive. punitive. Right. Well, I mean, often I think people are motivated. I had a bad experience with this person and I want to warn other people that they're going to get a similar experience or this this company did a really great job helping me out and I want to let other people know about that. Right. Although though I discovered in my travels in Europe where somebody, one business really went, you know, overboard in terms of abusing my naivete as a tourist. And in, in addition to writing a review, I wrote a Q and A and upvoted it. So it showed up on their profile all the time on the front page. So just, yeah. just as a note, if you really want to educate other consumers, you got to get that review sort of up and out and visible. So don't just leave it as a review, do it as a Q and A question and answer and upvote your answer. Much more, much more impactful. So, <laughs> few people are in the, the, the you know, the, have the inside sort of view that you do on on this. But uh, well, uh, you know, one I of was the, just sharing my insider view. You know, so yes, like you really, you really want to embarrass the business. There you go. One one of the things that we've been writing about and talking about here for some time is kind of peak reviews or the the flatlining or plateauing of review volumes, right? Both on Yelp and Google. Um, I wrote about this, I think, last Friday. Uh, Sochi data shows that Google review volumes have plateaued. Joy um, Hawkins this week had a case study that talked about the impact of review recency on rankings, and she she you know concluded that more recent reviews was important for rankings. So reviews continue to be really important, but people seem to be writing fewer reviews, and overall volumes have flattened. The, the Moz survey doesn't really get at that. There's a question about COVID and how it impacted review writing. And some people write more reviews, some people have written less, fewer reviews, but most people, they said that their review um, writing behavior has not changed. So it, it, it creates this impression that kind of, there's been this consistency over time, which may be sort of true. One. It it isn't true. I actually have a series of surveys that I will be publishing that shows that uh, in many cohorts, people are writing less reviews. The people that say never has dropped consist has lowered since its peak in 2017. Well, there's also there's also imperfect memory, right? People people don't accurately report on their own behavior, and we see from overall review volumes that they're that they're flat. I mean, there's enough aggregate data to show that, and you've written about that, Mike, but. Um, yes, but what we don't know, it, let's assume that that's true. We don't know why. What's what's interesting to me is the question about why are people writing fewer reviews? What's going on with their relationship to reviews that that are that is causing that behavior, or in the aggregate causing that behavior? M- one of my theories is distrust and 
uh, a sense that um, reviews are not as trustworthy as they once were. Also, you know, people's relationships to these companies has changed somewhat. Uh, but but one of the data points that I thought was interesting that I'll I'll talk about in in my own article about this is uh, the question the response to the question how much importance do you place on reviews when deciding whether to visit a local business thirty three say it's the thirty three percent say it's the most important factor or signal twelve uh, percent say it's slightly important two percent say it's the least important and fifty three percent the largest group say it's somewhat important which I think in many ways is a is a revealing and interesting data point we don't have any context we don't have any historical data about change over time. But I think that it indicates people are looking at reviews still, uh, taking them seriously, but not relying on them to the same degree that they were. Because a survey I did with Sochi a few years ago showed reviews being the most important factor in um, local business decision making. Now, that's not an apples to apples thing, but I think that it's reflective of some change in consumer attitudes. I would, another factor that I haven't quite looked at the data yet, but that could possibly be happening is changing cohort behaviors that the 18 to 24 year olds of today are both economically situated differently and exposed to different online services. And so they behave differently than the 18 to 24 year old cohort of two or three years ago or five years ago or whatever. Possibly 50% of them are migrating over to TikTok. And so there's just TikTok, not the yep. sort of engagement with Google that has been right. sort of a, a baseline given over the last 15, 20 years. So. Well, that's that's what we need to somehow get at. And I, th- I agree with that. I think that thesis is, is accurate, is that people are spending time on other services. I think editorial reviews have, have for maybe people in our general age cohort uh, are, are, are returning as as more important than maybe they have been. So I think there's a number of things going on and I think it's pretty interesting and it has some implications for Google ultimately. Um, but that's a longer discussion. Uh, We're just gonna make and- one comment that I don't, I don't think you brought up this piece of, of Miriam's uh, publication at Moz just yet um, in terms of why people don't leave reviews. And I think the encouraging thing for a lot of small businesses, well, I guess businesses of any size, but particularly small businesses I work with is the number one reason people don't leave reviews is eh, I sort of just forgot about it. And so right. having a program where you're sort of continually following up, it's not going to necessarily bother the person. They, in many cases, would leave you a review. It just sort of flashes into their stream of consciousness and flashes out immediately. And so that you, you do really need to, to set a system in place where you're following up multiple times with the folks who who don't leave you a review. The flip side of that is something like 20%, if I remember, maybe it's like 18, uh, said, ah, I'm too busy. I don't have time to do this. And I think that that's also a, you know, potentially could play a role in the behavior you're talking about, Greg, where, yes, yeah, some segment of the population is using other services, just not engaging with Google. And there's also this sense of like, I mean, we saw it during COVID, just like the incredible online all the time, being burned out, that sort of feeling, I think, is considerably stronger today than it would have been five years ago. And and people may just not want to deal with stuff like this. Uh, and now that the world is opening up again and everything else, there are so many better things to do with your time. So, so And the, the, the other interesting point to, to David's point about them forgetting was that their preferred method of being reminded was email. Email, yeah. Which I also right, which, thought spoke well and spoke to, you know, low costs and easy repeatability, that kind of thing that a business could engage in. So without without sort of opening a, a Pandora's box of advice here, um, you know, on that point, do you guys have perspective on how quickly businesses should follow up and request a review? I've been asked for reviews before the work was completed by somebody who's doing their job without really recognizing, you know, the, the sort of head and tail are not talking to each other. How soon after something is done or a visit has occurred, should they ask for reviews? And how frequently should they follow up? How many times? Do you have any quick response to that? I do. I think the first thing you should do is tell people you're going to ask them for review. And if you Ask, get their permission to ask them and their permission and the acknowledgement that they will review you, creating a social bond that doesn't exist otherwise. And then at the moment of pleasure, 
whatever that is in the sales cycle, then reach out to them. In other words, in your case, the job is done. Or in the case of retail, they've just bought some item. Or, you know, in the case of a car, they've been driving it for a week. I mean, I think it's a little different in every Vert industry. Vertical by vertical, yeah. Vertical by vertical. Like it, when you move into a, a storage unit, you're pretty stressed the day you move in. 30 days later, you're happy your shit's in the storage unit, right? So I think the, the moment of happiness is when you first reach out and then you follow up to a, maybe three times in total. You know, you don't get crazy about it. But you do follow up. So verbal commitment up front that they're going to hear from you and agreement that they'll respond, which increases the response rate. And then moment of happiness is when you interact. All right. Nothing totally to add, agree. David, I to that. Agree. Yeah, no, nothing to add. It's definitely industry dependent. You know, you've had a nice meal out. Probably the next day is the best time to ask. Uh, you got a new roof probably a month or even two months after that roof has been on is you know, or the first, the first big rain of the season, for example, uh, might be the best time. So. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks for joining David, Mike, and Greg. To stay on top of the latest developments in local, subscribe to our newsletter at nearmedia.co. We'll see you next week.